Just Liberty Live is coming to you from NRB, the Christian Media Convention. We've been talking to a lot of interesting people this week, and this is one of them sitting right next to me. He's a, a recently retired NFL player. Uh, he's gotten through some of the hardest times because he says God repeatedly showed up. We're going to talk to Benjamin Watson. Hi, I'm Stuart Shepard. This is First Liberty Live. Hi, Benjamin. Hey, Stuart. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, you're someone, I'm going to read your, your, a little bit of your bio here. You're an 04 first round draft pick. That's pretty impressive. And then you played for 16 years on four different teams, which is pretty impressive. You won Super Bowl 39 with the Patriots, which is pretty, I'm still ticked off about that one, but whatever. <laughs> and then in March of 2020, you retired from the NFL. I understand for the second time, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get enough. <laughs> so you retired and came back. In the post where you talked about retiring, you let your fans know that you were leaving the league and you wrote uh, about the dedication it takes to succeed. And, and you've put a lot into this. You can't, you can't succeed at that level without being dedicated to a, a point that I think most people can't comprehend what it takes to keep pressing through. But then you wrote also about some of the setbacks you've experienced in your career. And then you added this, and this is what, what got me. You said the prospect of what could be drove me to keep fighting time after time. And you said, ironically, it was through these cycles of perseverance that God repeatedly showed up and he worked in ways I would never have expected, imagined, or even desired in my limited mind. Describe for me those times God showed up in your life and what it meant to you. Yeah, so, you know, the, the NFL is, is, is a journey and we all keep playing. I kept going because you see where you want to be and you always think you can get better. You always think there's another championship on the horizon. You always have this goal of, of attainment. Um, but then there's injuries, there's surgeries, uh, there's setbacks. There's cross-country moves with your family. Um, there's death. Um, there's, there's all these sorts of things that happen and that you know, kind of impede our way. But God always showed up in, in how he took care of us. If we moved across the country with our five children and then with our seven children, um, he showed up and provided a home for us, just like that. If there was an injury and I thought I would never play again, you know, like tearing my Achilles and having surgery, he showed up the next year and said, you know what, I have more for you to do. Um, if there were times when there was doubt and fear, um, he continued to point me to the right person or the right scripture or the right passage um, and use people, including my wife, to encourage me. He had people in place to take care of us and our marriage and our relationship in times when we were struggling with different things. And so we saw his faithfulness throughout our entire career um, and really throughout our entire life. And so, you know, when I wrote that, it was kind of reflecting and saying that, you know what, God has us. You know, we see it in scripture. Many times we point at scripture and we say, well, we see what God did for that person. We see what God did for that person and for that person. They're not like us. No, they were just like us. And though they went through difficult times, God was always faithful. And it's important for me and for us as parents, uh, my wife and I, for our kids to understand that um, you know, my career was, was great. We, we enjoyed it. We had, we had struggles like anybody else does. Um, but the most important thing we learned was that, you know, we're not outside of his hand and we're not outside of his eye. He sees what's, what's happening. What's it like being a person of faith in the NFL with that much, that many cameras pointed at you, that much of a spotlight on, on what you do and what you talk about and what you stand for? What's it like being a person of faith in the middle of that? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's humbling. Um, you know, I, I never, I never wanted to do anything that would bring dishonor on the name of Christ. I think that's what every Christian should desire, that you never want to do something to bring dishonor. And we do something every day to bring dishonor, either, either in our thought pattern <laughs> or with our words or with our actions, we're going to do something. But you have to live with a sense of humility. But you also realize that, you know what, the fact that there are cameras, the fact that, you know, the NFL is a large platform. Lord, how do you want me to use this responsibly? Um, you don't need the NFL. You don't need the cameras. You don't need any of those things. But he gives all of us the opportunity to use whatever occupation he's given us. Mine happened to be pro football to further the kingdom and to tell people about him outside of the locker room. But also, most importantly, our biggest mission field is our family and our job, and for me, it was the locker room. How am I impacting the young men that are there? I, you've got a couple of family mottos that I've heard about, and I'd like you to unpack them. One is faith over fear, and the other is truth over trend. Tell me about those. 
Well, uh, the Bible says in 1 John, uh, I believe 4, it says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so this fear, this faith is greater than fear, um, you know, and this truth is greater than trend. Uh, specifically with the fear, um, we, we are fearful human beings. We, we fear, I mean, we just went through a global pandemic. Like our health was, was uh, strained, right? There were, uh, economically, it was scary because people lost their jobs. You know, people lost money, people lost opportunity. Um, you know, there's, there's violence. You know, we can go outside and get hit by a car. I mean, there are all these sorts of things that lead us to be people of fear. We doubt our, ourselves. When we look throughout scripture and we look at, you know, people that are giants like Moses, he was fearful, you know, but, but through faith, God allowed him to do all those sorts of things. And so it's just an encouragement that, um, you know, who shall I fear outside of the Lord? Um, the Lord is the one who says, said to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. And so I have to remind myself as, as a man who is finite and who is trying to be a parent to his kids and husband to his wife, and I'm scared about those things sometimes. He says, don't be afraid for I'm with you. And the truth is greater than trend. Everything, most things are trends. There's but one truth. The truth is, 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 is scripture. That's the truth. When it comes to issues of um, justice or kindness or humility, um, the truth is, is, is where we're rooted in, in God's word. Everything else is a trend. The Bible says it's gonna pass away. And so for me, it reminds me that be rooted in the rock. Don't be rooted in the latest thing in the United States or the latest thing in the world or whatever it may be. There's but one truth that is going to last. That's what scripture tells us. Now you mentioned you have seven kids. Two of them are pretty new, I understand. Yes, we have uh, identical twin boys that are two years old, Asher and Levi. I call them tornado and typhoon. <laughs> Uh, they tear up everything. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, we have three girls and, and four boys, uh, we, 12 down to two. We have five kids in a row. And then my wife loves even numbers. And so she said, you know what, let's go for number six. I'm like, I don't know about that. Uh, we decided to go for number six. And we had two miscarriages back to back. Realize how many women, how many men, families deal with miscarriage. Open up a whole new world uh, for us in a time of sorrow. Uh, and then we said, we'll try one more time and had identical twin boys. So now we have seven children. Fantastic. What kind of America do you hope to have in the future as your children get to be your age and want to live out their faith in whatever profession they choose? Yeah, yeah. You know, that, I think that's a question that so many of us think about, not just in this generation. I think every generation has their opportunity for the baton. Um, I love track growing up, track and field. I play football, but I love track. And, and what did you run? I ran the 100, 200, uh, 400, and the relays. Okay. So you were fast. I, yeah, I was fast. <laughs> I love to watch the relays. I love to see how the baton is passed from one person to the next. Yeah. And each person has a responsibility to carry that baton well. Um, specifically when it comes to, to America, there are, there are things that every generation needs to change, things that we need to keep the same. And so as I look at the future generation, what I'm trying to do is Again, going back to a truth that's greater than trend, I want my children and their communities and their neighborhoods and their cities and their states and their country to be rooted in truth. Now, America is a place where we have religious freedom, no doubt. You should never be told exactly what you have to believe. That's one of the hallmarks of this country. But I do believe that there is a certain truth that should be rooted and certain values that should be rooted uh, in a country. So I love to see those sorts of things. Um, but most importantly, um, I want to see a place where there's equity. I want to see a place where, where people are treated as human beings. I want to see a place where the preborn child is protected. I want to see a place where the, their mothers are offered whatever services that they need. That's what I'm doing with Human Coalition. You know, we talk about providing for preborn children and their mothers, but also advocating on a policy side. We'll talk more yeah. about that of in course. just a second. I'll give you a chance. Of course. I, I, I want to see a place where, um, when it comes to the issue of race in our country and where we have had, for the last 50 years, we've had disparities when it comes to employment, where we have a 10 to 1 wealth gap, where we have issues with policing, where we have the effects of redlining that are still going on in our country. I want to see that eradicated. Um, and I, I want to see America continue to be, you know, a country that does great good outside, because America has done some phenomenal good around the world. Um, but still, it's a place where we don't really know the entirety of our history, 
and we aren't able to fully embrace all of who we are because we don't know those things. So I hope that my kids' generation, you know, they'll look back and be like, you know what, America's an even greater place now um, than it was because we've taken that by the horns and we've done those things to make it happen. And it can happen. I believe it can too. I, you wrote something a few years ago that spoke to me. There's an article you wrote when you had the opportunity to baptize one of your teammates and his wife. And you wrote this, you said, God doesn't call us to live out of faith in secret. We're called to live out of public faith, letting people see that while we're imperfect, we're following our God with a heart fully devoted to Him. And then you quote uh, Jesus in Matthew 10, 22, you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Unpack that thought for us. Yeah, um, specifically when it comes to, to just showing your faith. You know, we, we who are married wear a wedding ring. <laughs> and, um, you know, you wear your wedding ring, wedding ring because it's, it's an outward expression of, of a covenant that's already happened. Um, and we have an opportunity, and we have a mandate, I believe, as believers to, to live our faith, yes, um, but, but to talk about it as well. Some reasons why we don't is because of fear. I'm afraid to be hypocrite, but then I realized we're all hypocrites, <laughs> but for God. And that's the whole purpose of grace is to, the fact that you're a hypocrite. I always so, tell people I always offer grace because they can't function without grace. Exactly, exactly. So that shouldn't keep us back. Um, but during that time, so I work with an organization, well, I've been a part of an organization called Pro Athlete Outreach. And um, it's, a, it's a ministry in the NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, um, and, and, and it's for believers or non-believers. but. When people do come to saving knowledge of Christ, they are baptized. Um, but, but, but our outward expression is a witness to the world. And so when we look throughout scripture, we know that Jesus promises. He doesn't promise that everything will be great. He doesn't promise that we'll be wealthy, but he does promise we will be persecuted. And so even as I, we think about raising our children, my wife and I try to raise kids to say, you know what? I hope you don't face those things here in this country in your lifetime, but history tells us and scripture tells us that you will be persecuted and people will treat you the same way they treated Christ. So don't be surprised. So don't be surprised. But still, by his grace and by his spirit and by his power, because it's not in ours at all, live a faith that is honest and open because it's contagious. And there have been so many times when one of my teammates have, has said something, you know, about their relationship with, with the Lord. And you'll see somebody else say, man, I was feeling the same way, but I just needed some encouragement. I, you, you now work for an organization, just took a new job, I understand, called the Human Coalition. Tell me what you do and what it's all about. Well, I, I've been on the board for Human Coalition for several years. It's, um, you know, a pretty large advisory board and have, um, you know, been involved. They're a pro-life organization. We're a pro-life organization. Um, we have brick and mortar clinics as well as telecare, um, but we also have an advocacy arm. So we're really the only class pro-life organization that has direct services, but also um, is involved with policy and, and advocacy in that way. Um, so we have the brick and mortar clinics, but we also what we call uh, telecare or telehealth. Um, and we have uh, clinics there in Chicago and other places. So we really are able to span the entire uh, country when it comes to providing services for women and then connecting them to our partner PRCs in their local areas. 75% um, of women would say that they would prefer to parent if their circumstances were different. And so kind of what drew me to Human Coalition um, is just the fact that you know we're willing to address some of the issues that women are facing when they're facing um, an, an unexpected or unplanned pregnancy. Um, willing to engage when it comes to how do I provide financial assistance if you need that. The first 48 hours are critical when it comes to a woman making a life decision. And so if we're able to stand in the gap and refer her or provide whatever it is, housing, economic opportunity, employment, educate, whatever it may be, meet her in her need um, and love the woman as well as the child, I think that's what it means to be truly pro-life. It means to love people on the spectrum of before they're born, pre-born child, all the way up until the time you leave this, this earthly life. How do we advocate and love people um, and serve and take care of life? Benjamin Watson, thank you for making time for us. Great chatting with you. Good to chat with you as well. Thank you.
and thank you for watching. If you'd like to join us in our work at First Liberty Institute, please drop by firstlibertylive.com. Uh, you can uh, like and share our videos from there and share with your friends and family if the, the, you think these messages will resonate with them as well. And of course, you can always click the big, big red donate button at the top. That's what allows us to do the work that we do, protecting and defending religious freedom for all Americans. And uh, one other thing, on your phone, you can download the app. Uh, just search for First Liberty Live. It's the easiest way to keep up with our content. Uh, just look for the First Liberty Live app. You'll recognize the logo when you see it. We'll see you next time right here on First Liberty Live.